Ephesians chapter 6, verses number 10, 11, and 12, and 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, once again we come to you with these glorious words in our hearts. We know that these words are written unto us who live at the end of the ages. They are written unto us who know the Lord. So Lord, we ask you to show us your glory in these words so that at a time like this where men are arguing, when men say that there is no devil, we can come to these words and behold your glory. So Lord, show us your glory in these words so that we can be, be conformed to the image of your Son. Show us your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have been looking at these words. These words from this book of Ephesians, this letter that is written to the Christians in Ephesus. We have been looking at it because these verses that I read to you in fact, to the end of the chapter, they represent one of the most glorious verses with regards to sanctification. It represents one of the most important scriptures with regards to warfare. and becoming like Jesus. This great apostle writes this letter to the Christians in Ephesus. From verses 1 to, from chapter 1 to chapter 3, he tells them who they are in Christ Jesus, and he tells them how they became what they are in Christ Jesus. In other words, from chapter 1 to chapter 3, he tells them about the doctrine, the gospel, the doctrine. And then from chapter 4 to chapter 6, verse 9, he tells them the application of doctrine. There are some people who do not believe in the doctrine. They do not study the doctrine. There are some people who think that to be, to be a Christian is just to be a moralist. They think that morality is equal to Christianity. They think that because they, because they do not steal and they do not commit adultery, now that they are better Christians. That is why you have the doctrines. If you don't know the doctrines, there is no way you can live as a Christian. It is the doctrine that tells you what to do and what not to do. The Christian life is an obedience to the word of God. A daily obedience to the word of God. You have to know what the word of God says in all the different circumstances that comes your way. You have to know what the word of God says. It is not by deducing. By the time you start deducing, you are now living according to the traditions of men. You are living 
If you are a Yoruba man, you are living according to the traditions of the Yoruba people. Or if you are a Robo man, you are living according to the traditions of the Robo. Or Shakiri, you are living according to the traditions of the Shakiri people. So Christianity is not a product of the morality of our different tribes and traditions. It is obeying the word of God. And the word of God is different from our different traditions. So the apostle writes this letter to these people. You know, myself and some brethren, we've been to Ephesus before. I always say this so that you can know, so that you can connect with what I'm saying to you. That Ephesus is not just a nebulous city somewhere, or an abstract city, or a biblical city that does not exist. Ephesus still exists today. When Ephesus, I think about five years ago. And we were at this church that this letter was written to. I stood, we stood there at the tomb of the Apostle John, Saint John, the tomb where he was buried. I stood at the baptistry of the church. This letter is written to them so that they can know who they are and how they became what they are. That is the doctrine. Without the doctrine, you cannot be a Christian. That is why this book, that is why I pray the prayer that I pray every day. It is not that I don't know how to pray another prayer, but this is the word of God. This is the prayer that I should pray. That these words are written unto us who live at the end of the ages. So that at a time like this, when people do not believe in warfare, at a time like this, when the church has been adulterated with all kinds of all kinds of teachings, we can secretly come to this book and see. All the writers of this book, all the writers of this different 66 books, they were all inspired by God. Their words were infallible. My word, my personal word, is not infallible. But these words that are written unto us, who live at the end of the ages, these words in this, in this book called the Bible, is an infallible word of God. You cannot mistake it. It is the word. It is from the mouth, from the heart of God. What is the apostle saying? The apostle is writing to these Christians in Ephesus who are already born again. And he tells them how you became a Christian. Who you are in Christ. He tells them about the blood of Jesus. He tells them about justification. That you are becoming a Christian is based on that legal transaction that took place on the cross. The cross represents the greatest legal transaction the world has ever seen. Here you are, here I am, standing there, guilty, truly guilty. I've stolen before. I've committed adultery before. I have lied several times. I have done all of these things several I have fornication. I have done all of these things. And the Bible says, the soul that sin it, it shall die. The apostle reminds this Ephesians that this was your position. You were in darkness. Then you came to the cross. And then the Son of God that can replicate himself. You know, some people have problems with how can Jesus save the whole world. Well, it is simple. This is God. God can replicate himself. It's a, it's a legal transaction of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Life for life. Goat for goat. That was the Old Testament law. 
And this is God. He can replicate himself into billions and billions of people. He can save to the uttermost. And there you were, and there I was at the cross. Guilty. And he came and took your sin upon himself. And because he took your sin and my sin upon himself, he himself became a sinner. He who knew no sin was made sin. And now that he's made sin, he was punished for that. And he set you free and set me free. This was what the apostle was telling them. And then, having told them that, he said, now that you have been set free, will you continue in sin? Will you continue in sin that grace may abound? You have been saved by grace. And the book of Romans, he said, God forbid, how shall I? How shall I, who died, who was crucified with Christ, died with him, buried with him, and resurrected with him to die no more. That the person that is living now is a new creation. It's different from that old man. How can I, a new creation, he that is born of the flesh is flesh. But he that is born of the spirit now is spirit. The spirit cannot become flesh. The flesh can become spirit. But the spirit cannot become flesh. He said, now that you are spirit. He said, now walk as a spiritual man. Now walk in the light. The application of doctrine. Now steal no more. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. Therefore, you cannot join the body, the temple of God, which is filled with the Holy Spirit. You cannot join that body to the body of an harlot. You cannot. These two things don't go together. Spirit and flesh don't go together. They are, they are like oil and water. They don't mix together. You mix them together and leave it alone. It will separate. He said, now walk. You see, the doctrine leads you to the application of that doctrine. It leads you to what you might call practical Christianity. This was what the apostle was telling them. Having said all of this to them, it was as if at the end he asked the efficient Christian, do you understand what I'm saying? And they all said, yes, sir. We understand. Repeat to me what I just said to you. Sir, Apostle Paul, you say that we are born again, we are filled with the Holy Spirit, and that now we are a new creation. And as a new creation, we should now live the new life, which is in Christ Jesus. And the Apostle says, Wow, you got it. And then the efficient Christians, they shouted, Now we understand. And it was as if they had just said the grace to go home. Now let's go and live the Christian life. I'm not going to steal any longer. I've been told. I'm not going to lie any longer. The Spirit of God is in me to lead me. I'm not going to commit adultery again. The door of the church has been opened for them to go. And then he said, finally. And the people look back. What else? He said, come back. Take your seat. There's something important that I need to tell you. Now he tells them, he said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. What is the apostle saying to them? He's telling them, you see, you see the Christian life is it's not a life that you can live in the vacuum. He said, all what I've just told you is true. 
But there's something I, I intend to tell you. There are some agents outside there. They are called principalities and powers. Spiritual wickedness. Rulers of darkness. They are outside there. And they will not allow you to live the Christian life. Sir, we don't understand. I am saying to you that there are some demonic agents, Satan, and all his courts, they are outside there. They will not allow you not to steal. It, he's telling them that it is not sufficient for you to say, you are born again and filled with the Holy Ghost. He said, it is not sufficient for you. He said, now that you are filled, you are born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, there are some agents outside there that will compel you to commit adultery. That when you go out, don't think it is just easy. No, I won't, I won't do it. That is just a question of psyching yourself and say, I'm not going to do it. And then... You start going into the world and not doing it. He's saying to them that there are some agents there who will convince you, who will wrestle with you, who will fight you until you commit adultery, until you steal, until you disobey the word of God. Their intention, their purpose, their, their, their motive is to make sure you disobey the word of God. Is to make sure that you steal. They would put it upon you. They will cajole you. They will do everything. They will put a spell around you. They will bewitch you. Steal. Steal. Adultery. It's okay. It's okay. No, no, no. I don't want to do it. It's okay. Do it. Nobody's seeing you. It's good. You like it. Don't you like her? Go on. That's what the apostle is saying. You see the importance of this. And the apostle goes on to tell them that he goes on to remove the darkness from these agents. Who they are so that you can know who they really are. I am just trying to summarize all what we have said before now so that we can continue. Last week we talked about principalities and powers, who they are. We talked about spiritual, uh, 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 the rulers of darkness. We talked about all of this. And we said that these agents, they are not just an influence, they are personalities. That the devil is not an influence. The devil is a spirit. Is a person. It is not just the air. No. is a particular person. It's not everywhere. It's a particular person that is in a particular place at a particular time. And then we talked about principalities that these are the agents that the agents of darkness of the devil they are in a hierarchy you have principalities principalities these are the demons that are in charge of certain areas and I said to you that it is for this reason that you see that the nations behave in particular in peculiar ways, particular ways compared to other nations. And I said to you, you notice that the Yoruba people, they are a peculiar people. This is because there's one principality that is in charge of all the Yoruba people. So they all behave the same way. Generally. So if you are outside, if you are not a Yoruba person, and you look at the Yorubas, you see that there are some peculiarities amongst the Yorubas that you don't find in other tribes. And this is because of the principality. You conform to what you worship. 
You take the similitude of what you worship. And also you see the Igbos, they are the same. But when you go amongst the Yorubas, for example, the Igbos, the Shakiris, the Ijos, the Robos, they all behave the same. The tribes, they all behave, behave the same. So you, there's this familiar spirit that, that is within them. So it's a kind of, they have a kind of leader, a kind of demon that is in charge of that principality. What is a principality? A principality is a small nation and a miss inside a bigger nation. And the head of that small nation is what you call a principality. That small nation inside a big, bigger nation, it's all, it has the same name, principality. Take for example Monaco. Monaco is a principality. Monaco is within France. It's inside France. It is a principality. It is a small nation inside another bigger nation. It, I mean, the Vatican, for example, is a principality. It is a small country inside a bigger country. And the Pope is the head of that principality. And within that principality, you have powers. So you have, for example, within the Robo people, you have Agbaro people, you have people from Egini, you have people, the same thing, all tribes. The Shakiris, you have people from Jakba. But when you look at them from outside, they resemble. But when you go within their midst, oh, then you discover that people from this village, because the villages, they have powers. They behave the same way. And then it comes to families. And then you see, you have all those powers in families. You see families, they are the same. Poverty in some families, some families, the women never marry. In some families, the men, they are wayward, they, they drink, and uh, uh, they're like vegetarians. They never. And I was saying to you that knowing this, what have I done? That was the prayer we prayed during the prayer and fasting, is to extricate myself from any of these principalities. I don't belong. I am not a Shakiri man. I am a man of the kingdom of God. I belong to the kingdom of God. I do not subject myself under any principality or under any power or under any ancestral or familiar spirit. I have extricated myself. Now I am a member of the kingdom of God. I don't behave like the Shakiri people. Why? Because I don't want to put myself under any principality or under any cause. I want to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. I am under the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Amen, somebody. So this is what this apostle is telling these Christians. So last week we were talking about the rulers of this dark world. The question to ask is this. Why do people behave the way they do? What is wrong with the nations? That they should be building up armaments that are capable of destroying the whole world. What is wrong? Look at North Korea. For example, right now. Look at Russia. Look at America. Look at these countries. Only one country has armaments that is capable of destroying the whole world. So what is wrong? What is happening? If I look at this, uh, this fat boy, this uh, small boy in, uh, in North Korea, the fat boy, what has gone into him? Don't you see that there's something that is not normal? That is in the head of this uh, fat boy. Don't you see him? He's joking. He's joking with people's like He's laughing. I mean, he thinks that is a video game that is playing. Dangerous game. Can't you see it? That there's something out there that is ruling the mind. What is the cause of the widespread immorality and the collapse of everything that borders on holiness. Don't you see that today they are even laughing 
There are some cities in the world that you go to. There are some areas in San Francisco in the United States that you go to. And if you are holding your wife and moving on the street, the people are laughing. They are laughing at you. Now that is old fashioned. Old fashioned. What is that? The new thing is uh, Steve and, uh, and Mike. Steve and Mike. Holding their hands. You know, sometimes uh, my, my, our daughter, Jemine, was uh, for a vacation job, was working in a pharmacist as a pharmaceutical assistant. And she was telling us the story that uh, the, a man came to the pharmacist, I mean, to the pharmacy, and wanted a drug. And then this was a prescription drug. And the man gave the prescription. And she said, Where is your ID? You must show your ID to go. It's not in Nigeria where anybody goes to the, uh, to, uh, the pharmacy, whatever drug you want to attack, yeah, yeah. It's how many you want. <laughs> they will give it to you. Any drug you want, poison, whatever, they will give it to you in Nigeria across the counter. But in the U.S., it's not only that. It is only by prescription. They want to make sure that you are the one. So, so he gave the prescription on the counter and said, where is your ID? To show that you are this, this person on the, on the prescription. Oh, and the man, oh, it belongs to my wife. Then Jimena said, Call your wife. Steve! Steve, where are you? They want to see you here. And then Steve came. That was the man. And handed his prescription. Of course, the drug was given to his wife named Steve. <laughs> the point is, what is going on? Can't you see it? Can't you see that everything that borders on holiness is being brought down? What causes all of this? There are unseen rulers. That's what the apostle is saying. Unseen rulers who are manipulating world affairs. It is not just flesh and blood. That's what he's telling us. Telling us. It is not just an occasional man who wants to make money from vice or from pornography. It is not just some men who want to make money from governance. No. They are but the instruments. All of these men, they are but the instruments of the rulers of this darkness. Don't you see is it normal for a man, one man, to carry six billion dollars in this country away? The question is, what are you going to do with it? <laughs> I know some of you now are saying, Tali, which kind of question be that? What you go do with six billion dollars? Tali, give them to me now, you go see. You go see, I go spend them between now and evening. It means you don't know what six billion dollars is. In Nigeria, you will spend it and spend it. You never finish. But you see one man taking that money. Whereas, what do you want to eat? Or what do you want to wear? The world doesn't even have merchandise for a man that has all that money. What do you want to buy? You can buy anything. Anything you want. So, don't you see what is happening? Ritual, murder, and all that. Don't you, don't you see that there are some agents and the apostle Paul says, we are not wrestling with men. These are not, don't look at these men, says Paul. We are not wrestling against flesh and blood. But we are wrestling against unseen powers that are behind all of this. There are powers. It is these powers that really matter. So we come to the last term of what we are talking about, of this particular uh, verses, which says against spiritual wickedness in high places. That is what we are going to look at this morning. Spiritual wickedness 
in high places. This is how it is presented in the King James Version. I noticed that most of the commentators, as I was preparing this, amended this translation. The or, in the original text, it means wicked spirits. It's talking about wicked spirits rather than wickedness. There's a distinction. When you say wickedness, you are probably talking about some of these spirits. Sometimes they are good, but sometimes they are bad. That's the connotation. But when you say that these spirits, they are wicked, that is the generic character of these spirits. These are spirits in which don't just waste your time to say, I beg now. Oh, you know, Nigerians are always finding small thing for somebody. I will find small thing for you. Just leave me first. Okay, okay. I will leave you. But <laughs> this small thing when you give me so you go expire tomorrow. That is sometimes they can do good. Sometimes they can do bad. No. These are wicked spirits. They are looking at you and they are destroying you. That is their character. No matter what you say. No matter what you do. You know there are some ladies who believe that uh, they will not go to hell. As you see me so. So you may say God will see me like this. As I find this so. Look me first. God will just see me, carry me, go hell. Hey. You go to hell. <laughs> you will. In fact, it's not even God that will take you to hell. It's the spirits that will do it. You belong to us. You have, you have always been one of us. And where we go, that's where you go. You belong to my principality. The other one, you belong to my powers. You have always been an Urobo man. You have always been a Shakri man and a Joe man. We have always ruled you. You have always participated in all the traditions, all the juju, all the ceremonies, all everything. You have always been one of us. And you are following us to the bottom of the pit. They are wicked spirits. It is spiritual forces of wickedness that the apostle is describing. Not spiritual wickedness, but that the spirits themselves, they are generically, they, that is their nature, to be wicked. We must avoid thinking of these matters in abstract terms. We must avoid thinking that uh, uh, well is an influence. No. These spirits, they are particular. They are particular spirits. God knows them one by one. When they see you like this. You see, a lion does not see an, antel an antelope. And so this antelope is fine. I know what chopper. It's fine. It's too fine. It's too fine. Fine snake. Oh, no, no, kill her, no, kill her, no, kill her. Hey, this snake, fine. Just a black, black. Oh, no, he both snake. She has the snake yellow. Leave him. Anytime we see snakes in this country, you know, sometimes it baffles me when I see people, especially Oibo people, who use snakes as pets. That be me and you. <laughs> Any snake as far as we are concerned in this country, must die. <laughs> Amen, somebody. You will not see a snake and take it to your house and take it to your wife. I see one snake for the garden. He's fine. Yeah, you bring it to your wife. Uh, for your birthday. That's what the apostle is saying. The apostle is emphasizing that all these powers 
are personal. They are personal demons. They are in legions. They are in battalion. They are many. Each one of them is an entity. So we should read, not spiritual wickedness, we should read it as wicked spirits or battalion of wicked spirits. Amen. Or legion of wicked spirits. Their nature is evil. Their commission is evil. Their work is evil. They are evil in their object and purpose. They do not sorry. All they want to do is to kill and to destroy. But according to the King James Version, it says that they are in high places. Again, it is interesting to observe the term used here. Why did the translators say high places here in this verses in this Ephesians 10, 12. Why did they say high places? Because if you go to the same Ephesians if you go to the same Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 3, you will see that it is the same Greek word that is used in Ephesians 1 3 and in this particular text it is the same Greek word in verse 12 which is in high places spiritual wickedness which I said wicked spirits in high places it is the same Greek word and if you go to Ephesians 1 3 you will see it in Ephesians 1 3 it is translated in heavenly places but here, it is translated high places. Why? Why did it translate us? Why did they use these two different terms? It is clear. You remember, I was telling you that they did not want to confuse it. Because if they had said heavenly places in Ephesians 6.10, then some of us might think that, oh, they live in the same, uh, uh, in the same kingdom with the angels of God. In Ephesians 1 3, the apostle is describing the angels of God. The, 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 the word heavenly places, principalities and powers in heavenly places, is the same thing. But you know, so the devil too arranges his own hierarchy, the same thing as God arranges his, his own hierarchy. We have principalities and powers in heaven, the hierarchy of the angels. So here, as the apostle is describing the hierarchy of the devil, he uses the word in high places in order to distinguish it from the ones in heaven. So we must not think that the devil and the powers associated with him are in the immediate presence of God. That's what the apostle is trying to think, is trying to show us. So that you don't think that these the demons of darkness, they are in the presence of God. They are, they are, no, they are, of course, high places. You know, of course, there are three heavens. We have the cloudy heavens, the cloud that you see. Then you have the stellar heavens. And then you have the heavens of heavens. You remember the other time I was showing you, some of you, those of you were here, when I was showing you what the cosmos is, the distance between the earth and the sun, the distance between stars, the distance and that the, 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 the stellar heavens is made up of uh, galaxies. And each galaxy has billions of stars. And then we have billions of galaxies. So you can see that the stellar heaven is vast. Is vast that the distances are measured in light years. So that's what the apostle is trying. But all of them, they are called the heavenlies. Well, what I'm saying now, it has been a matter of discussion for centuries. There are some Christians who were confused at 
what I am saying now. Because when they say the heavens, because at that time, they didn't have the idea of what the universe is like. That the universe is made up of uh, 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 galaxies. And that each galaxy, the galaxy is a cluster of stars. And the sun is just one star. The, the sun, which we have now, is just one star in a galaxy of billions of stars. And this galaxy in which we belong is called the Milky Way. And this one galaxy is just one. This cluster of stars that is made up of billions of stars is just one galaxy. And that there are other galaxies, billions and billions, that scientists don't even know how many galaxies there are. Billions. And after this area of billions and billions of galaxies, then you have the heavenly the heaven of heavens where God dwells I remember when I was teaching this and I was telling you it is for this reason that the apostle Paul says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God how can you how can a man in flesh and blood travel to the kingdom of God when scientists are still struggling to get to some the planets when scientists just got to moon from here to the moon is just, I think about 100, uh, I can't remember, 186,000 miles or less than that. I can't remember right now. But it's very, very close. But what we are talking about, there are light years, millions and millions of light years away. So people were confused which of the heavens. Is it the same heaven? But the heaven is not just a locality. It is vast. So this Rulers of darkness, these wicked spirits, they are in high places. They are in the heavenlies, but not where God is. So we speak of heavens, we, see, we speak of heaven and earth. In other words, the high places means the heavenly places. It is the same thing. In contradistinction to the earth. So what can we get out of this? It is this. What is the apostle trying to say in essence? It is this. That these wicked spirits, they do not dwell on earth. They are not terrestrial. They are not biological. They are not flesh and blood. They are spirits. And they live in the heavenlies. Our wrestling is essentially with these agents of darkness who are in the heavenlies, who are in the realm of the heavenlies. So the question is this why am I telling you all of these things? I am telling you all of these things so, as a child of God, you will know. A child of God is a man that knows. Because when you don't know, when you are in ignorance, then you start thinking that, oh, oh, uh, because I see some pastors talk about Kovun. Kovun? I don't know where they got about that. I don't know. What I know is what is in this Bible. The rest is tradition. What the Bible describes, what the New Testament tells us about the realm of the kingdom of darkness. In the book of Romans, in the book of Romans, why do some Christians eat? I was teaching this on, on Wednesday. Why do some Christians eat meat offered to idol? Those who are strong in the faith, they eat meat offered to idol. And those who are weak in the faith, do not eat meat offered to idol. Why? It is because those who are strong in the faith, they understand what I am now telling you. They know that that idol that is in Orubo, for example, that idol that is 
in Obodo, for example, that is in Agbasa, that they put there in that shrine. Any meat that is offered to it, those Christians who are strong in the faith, who understand what I'm telling you now, when you give him that meat, he will eat it. If you give me that meat now, we eat it. Why? Because I know there's no God. These people are foolish. Praise the name of the Lord. This place is quiet. Because I know there is no small God with a G. That all that Obodo Juju that they give name. Egbesu. That is a God. There's nothing like that. Are you listening to what I'm saying? There's nothing like that. There, so because I know there's nothing like that, and that this fool, these people, the devil, has blinded them to think that there's a God. What I know is that there's one demon behind it there. But not that there's a God. So because I know that there's one demon, and I know that that demon cannot contaminate the meat. <laughs> cannot contaminate the meat. Amen, somebody. He does not have the power. Why? Because I know these things. He does not have the power to contaminate the meat. So when you give me the meat, I will eat it. Because I know it is the people that are foolish. They are thinking that they are sacrificing to a God, whereas there is no God there. There is only one God. And that God is the God that is already seated on the throne. Amen, somebody. There is only one God. The others, they are called principalities and powers. Amen, somebody. The rulers of darkness. Spiritual wickedness in high places. This is, this is it. This is the truth. So, that's why you see there are some Christians, because they understand this, they walk into the shrine, that shrine, they say, no good, no good, no good. Huh. The place, they keep passing. They walk inside there, kick the shrine, play everything, throw everything away. And people are watching him. He goes house and he sleeps well. And they are waiting for him to die. Eh? When I see they believe, when I see they wait for me to die. Why? Because there's nothing there. Amen, somebody. The only thing that you have, they are called what? principalities and powers. These are demons. There's no God. There's nothing like gods. Gods of the sea. Is it not foolish when you see people who are going to do uh, Oloku, Umaloku, they go to the river and throw. And that's why you see all those boys in Pesu River, they are waiting. They are waiting. In those days, if you live in worry, we used to do it. You see some foolish women and men, they are bringing their daughters to dedicate them. They bring Fanta, all of this is chicken, and you see the boys there in the river. <laughs> Mommy, try for my side, they'll try for my side. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. If, if, uh, some of you, we have done these things before, isn't it? We are all worried people, and there's a rule to it. When they throw the Fanta, you must make sure so you enter the water first before you dive out. If you take it in the air, then the woman will be angry with you. The river. But so long you let it enter. Mommy, I know you take her move. I know go catch her for air. But don't try too deep. You try them inside the water. Then it has entered. Mommy, don't enter water. You don't enter water. Then you dive it. Praise the name of the Lord. And then you dive all the bottles. All the crate of mineral. You dive it. All the things they bring. Sometimes they bring uh, chicken and all that. You dive all. Take. Amen, somebody. Then after that, you go, to, you go to the shore and you open everything. Everybody will drink. Foolish people. <laughs> I'm alive today. <laughs> Amen, somebody. They are alive today. In those days, in worry, a belabor tree, purple tree, they put juju and all that. We didn't know. We're just children. But God has predestinated us to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And so when we go there, we put the juju down from the purple. After you put the juju down from the guava, then you go pluck all, finish. Then carry the juju, you put them back. Then when the owner of the purple come, he will start making noise for where we are at the corner looking at him. We are like matured Christians. Christians who are matured in the faith. We know that there's nothing there. 
nothing there. Amen, somebody. You see, it is for this reason, when you see some pastors today, they behave as if they have some extraordinary power. It is for this reason, you see, that you grieve the Holy Spirit when you see some pastor walk into the shrine as if, no, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. So that is, it is for this reason that I'm teaching you now, I'm showing you what is in the Bible. It's there, but you didn't notice it. You read it, you didn't notice it. It is there, so that you don't fear. I was telling them on Wednesday that during the war, the Biafran war, we were in big worry at that time. For weeks, while the war was raging, and the whole island was filled with many people. So they were doing all of these, their festivals. And, and one of them constitutes what they do in the night. They say a god will come in the night. So around one o'clock in the night, we'll be hearing everybody. My mom, for example, She'll be shivering. They say that the juju night they pass, so go around the whole village. So some of us who were young men at that time, eh? That juju is. But as you are in the house, there were mud houses. As we are in the house, you could hear them, the men whispering, talking. You could hear the footsteps. You see, it's not human being. No. They say it's juju. That some of the jujus they are like human beings. So some of us, the young men, decided that one night, huh, we'll come out and see. So we came out, secretly, to watch. What were they? They are the same people. Oh, is that not a Is that not a uncle this, uncle this? What did they do? They had this ruler. It's made up of this. It's like a ruler. They tie rope on it. And then they go like this. Woo! The two will be like, woo! And everybody said, everybody thinks that that is the juju. No. You see, they are just men, men fooling men to think that there's something there. But the God has removed us from darkness into his marvelous light. So anytime, anytime you see a shrine there, anytime you see a shrine, there's nothing there. Amen, somebody. There is nothing there. It is for this reason, even in the Bible, the Lord told Gideon, go and destroy your father's shrine. Go and destroy your father's shrine. And then Gideon, Gideon did it at night. Nothing happened. Then the people said they would kill Gideon. Then the father said, let the juju fight himself. Make him fight. Of course. Nothing. It is for this reason that I'm showing you this morning. Amen. What I'm trying to, what I'm saying, what the apostle is saying to you. So that, <clears throat> so that you will know these things. So these spirits, they are personal spirits who live in the heavenlies. You must do battle, you must do battle with them. Not to steal. That's what the apostle is saying. For you, it is not sufficient for you to be born again, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. No. The apostle says, finally, be strong in the Lord. What is that, be strong in the Lord? Position yourself as a child of God. For you not to steal, there's this demon whose specialty is to steal. He will convince you to steal. He will do everything to tell you to steal. It does not matter whether you, have, whether you have or you don't have. Even if you have excess, have you not noticed it? Don't you see what is happening? That the so-called people, the person stole uh, $3 billion here. And he comes here again. He has $3 billion. And he's still stealing. There are some permanent secretaries in this country. When you see them in the office, they wear tattered clothes and all that. 
If you see the office, the carpet, if you look at the carpet, you will find it difficult to, is it carpet or is it ground? You cannot tell. The furniture everywhere. Then you come there to go and look for his favor. After talking to him, you look at the man. This man, poor. Uh, sir, I just said, uh, bring this one for a small Fanta. You have 5,000. That's all you have. You give him 3,000. He will take it from you. You stand up. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Some of them will say, hey, wait him. Put still put small now. It's only 3,000. I said, yes, so your paper, now me pass some more. They say, okay, 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 sir. Then you put a 500 join now. 3,500. Then he takes it. Thank you, thank you. The man has 500 million in his account. So the question is this. Why? This is what the apostle is talking about. There are these demons. You have made up your mind not to steal. You have made up your mind not to commit adultery. And so on. You have made up your mind to obey the word of God. They will come. You must steal. Steal. Ah, that money, 500 million. What be that? That money be that? That money be that? Please. I see. It becomes an attitude that he cannot break himself from. There are some men who cannot do without committing adultery. It is not that their wife is not around, that their wife travels. The wife is ever ready. The wife is there. But this man, nothing. It's as if there's a button in his head. The demon will go there, press the red button. Oh yeah, you just see the man. I they come just now. <laughs> he must. He must. The apostle is saying, in order for you. To be victorious over one particular sin, you must fight. You must do battle. That's the purpose of these verses. You must wrestle with them in your mind because they will convince you. They will tell you everything. Go. It's nice. If you steal, you'll be richer. Look at you. You are poor. Your children, they have to pay school fees. What will you do now? Time is going. You must do warfare. They are the devil, the god of this world, and the principalities, the powers, the rulers of darkness, and spirits of evil in the heavenly realm. Thank God that the apostle introduces us to all of this so that we know. As I said, the child of God is a man that knows. He knows all of these things. He's not ignorant of the devices of the devil. He knows everything. He's not a man that the kingdom of darkness would be a mystery because there are some Christians who don't know this and then when they see a shrine I better come here, go quick, quick, come, come, come. No, go there. No, pass there. They say, woman, no, they pass there. What do you, woman, no, they pass? Oh, I say, when woman they in period, you know they pass that road. Now this road. Now if you pass, nonsense. Are you? Are the women here? Nonsense. Well, if you want to obey their tradition, yes, you, you can do that. You don't want to get yourself pass another road. But there are some communities in which this thing is so much that we put fear. In the heart of a Christian. It is for this reason that you find some Christians, they don't eat meat offered to idols. They are called weak Christians in Romans 14 and 15. Why? Because they don't know these things. They don't know. So they are afraid. They are thinking that there's a God. They are thinking that there's a God, really. You know, there are some people who think that 
when you see like this hurricane, some people say it's a God. It's a God. Why they blow like that? Some people think, even amongst us, that this is a local, that there's, there's a God in the sea. God of the sea. Some people think that there's a God, a small God in the sea. There's nothing. Amen, somebody. Dry the whole sea now. Nothing. There's no God there. If there's anything you will see, crayfish, <laughs> periwinkle, small, small fish, all of those things. There is no God there. When you see people saying they are going to do Olokun, they are foolish. Foolish. And if you are there, they are throwing all of those things inside water, please catch them and take them home. <laughs> Amen, somebody. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory be to the Lord. So if after I have said all of these things that I have said to you, you feel discouraged and afraid, it means that you have not understood it. You didn't understand what I'm saying. What the apostle again is saying, that though these agents are there, he's saying, the power that is inside you, that's why it says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might so that when you go out there I'm telling you that that power is inside you it's greater than that power all of these principalities all of them put together I'm telling you so when you go outside if you say I don't want to steal in the name of Jesus it will be so Amen somebody so that is what the apostle is saying that the power inside you the power of the Holy Spirit, the second person of the Trinity, is far more than all of them outside there. He's telling you not to forget what you have inside you. I'm talking of those who are born again now. I'm not talking of those who say they are born again and they are not born again. Because if you say you are not born again and you go into those type of places, well, guilty conscience alone will kill you. Because you will now think that, oh, the devil will start putting tricks inside you. The wiles of the devil. That's the meaning. Tricks. We'll come to that later. Tricks. The devil will now start suggesting to you. The devil will now start putting fear into you. Na juju, na juju, poison. And na juju, you don't catch you now. Because you don't know. But when you know it, then you know there's nothing like that. You know, when sickness, many times when doctors tell people that they have cancer, what kills them is not even the cancer, it's the fear. The fear. The fear. So, listen again to what the apostle says with regard to all of this. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. You find it, it is listed there, the armor of God. Not some, all. And one of them is the sword of the spirit. The word of God. You know the word of God. You know what I'm talking to you. This is the glory of the Christian position. That though I am confronted by such an enemy, I need not be afraid. Now, listen to this. It is not sufficient To call somebody out, as I am now, the pastor of this church, to call somebody out and say, You are blessed. 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 Shout hallelujah. And everybody shout hallelujah. There is no amount of blessing that you can bless a snake. Put a snake on the floor there. Put a viper on the floor there. And say you are blessed. You are blessed. You are blessed. Then take her and go carry her. <laughs> Blessing is not what you seek. You don't seek blessing. You don't seek happiness. Blessing is what you get. 
when you seek righteousness let me say that again if you look at Matthew Matthew chapter 5 verse number 6 the sermon on the mount he said blessed are they there are some specific there are some special people not everybody he said blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness in other words the people that God blesses are those who have a hunger and a thirst to do warfare so they can live the righteous life in other words the man who is blessed the man who is rewarded is the man that he comes out and says i am not going to commit adultery for example and he does not and he becomes victorious as he's going away without committing that adultery god stamps him with blessing this place is too quiet blessing is not what you seek after happiness is not what you seek after you must do something first before you are blessed when god blessed abraham it was because righteousness was accounted unto him the people that god blessed is because they are doing the word of god it's because they have fought the fight of faith and then god rewards them joseph was a small boy sold as a slave and he was in the house of potiphar with the madame beautiful madame and the madame enticed this poor little boy that was sold that was already in depression the favorite son of jacob was sold here he was alone this was the boy the sweet boy at home the favorite of his father they they sold him a slave and then he found himself as house boy in the house of potiphar he was reliving in depression and while that man went to walk the woman said come 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 and the boy said no come no come no and forced him what did he do he fled flee he ran away as he was fleeing he ran ran past prison as he was running where was he running to oh i thought somebody knew he ran to the position of what prime minister be running from that adultery was what led him to become the prime minister of where of the whole of egypt if joseph that was the reward for his victory christians when we die the judgment is not a judgment of whether we will make heaven we have already made heaven amen we are already seated with christ what god has begun he's able to bring it to an end we are already glorified it's not we will be glorified we are already glorified the judgment of christians is a judgment of what a judgment of reward how many victories did you have you know there are some christians no victory at all no righteousness at all except the righteousness that was imputed at the cross they did not fight this good fight of faith that yes with the power of the holy spirit i was able to reject the devil on that day of judgment among the christians is a judgment of reward how many things you have done how many victories you have won for every victory you will be rewarded what is the difference between two Christians? The difference between two Christians is, it's not that they were born again, is how many battles they have won. On that day, amen, like the Roman general, 
who went to a battle and was victorious by the time he comes in into Rome with Caesar sitting up there exalted and all the other senators all of them there he is riding into Rome in the chariots standing and raising his hand and the whole of Rome all the angels all sharing hey, sharing him and then he walks up the stairs to where Caesar is and he bows and then Caesar says faithful and courageous soldier and he takes the crown and puts it upon his head that is how the judgment is going to be because God expects us that is the distinction on that day people who escaped you see that's what it was with Joseph and his brothers Joseph was exalted above all his brothers he was exalted why because look at what he went through that is the distinguishing factor. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who fight this fight. This battle. Not to sin. Not to steal. Not to commit adultery. I said, no. I take my son. I'm strong in the Lord. I take my son. I'm not going to fall for this. I am not going to fall for this. God will reward you. Not only on earth here, but also in heaven. So, what am I saying? You may come here. I may lay hands on you as many times as I want. I may lay hands on you. Whereas, you have two wives. Whereas, you are stealing. Can a man like that be blessed? No. No. The man who is blessed is a man that hungers for righteousness the man who is blessed is a man that obeys the word of god and does the word of god and then god will bless him will reward him openly shall we bow our heads